guys, Comic Boom here to talk about uh, DC Studios. James Gunn's big announcement. I wanted to give my two cents worth because everyone and their dog is commenting on the uh, DC movie slate, so I figured I'd better as well. I am so happy to hear. I personally, I love this slate. I, I love what James Gunn has uh, announced. And, you know, some of them are better than others, but the bottom line is, is that finally we get some semblance of a plan, some semblance of a plan. And you know what, it's better to have a plan than to have nothing. So it's good that we have a plan. James Gunn says that he's gonna be focused on the writing. He wants to get it done right. He wants the directors and the writers and the producers all to have essentially working on with the same game plan, the same sort of vision. Obviously he wants to purge directorial input and all that other jazz, but but basically, you need a plan. It's like, because he, he sort of made some hints and alluded to the fact that DC movies up until now have sort of been the equivalent of uh, kind of like thro throwing things against the wall and hoping something will stick, right? So it's good to see that they have a plan. And it's really, really good to see that uh, we're going to be getting... Uh, there's 10 things that he on the slate that he mentioned. Uh, Creature Commandos, Waller, Superman Legacy, Lanterns, The Authority, Paradise Lost, Brave and the Bold, Booster Gold, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, and Swamp Thing. And I want to go through each of them uh, one at a time here. So the first thing that I want to deal with is uh, Creature Commandos. Creature Commandos, you know... Of all the of all the things that they that uh, J James Gunn could have you know brought up, like he said, this is a little bit of a project that they got going on. This surprised the hell out of me, but pleasantly, you know, I've collected I, I've collected DC comics my whole life, and I'm going on like my 44th year of collecting DC comics. Man, I love DC comics, and it's it's pretty much been mostly all DC, and I bet you I have. Maybe I've got about 50, maybe 60 Creature Commando comics. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of them are doubles and what have you. And so I and I, I honestly can't remember reading a lot. I, I can't remember a heck of a lot about them, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, uh, they remind me not, now I read I like reading the adventures of Frankenstein in the DC universe. You know, it was Fr Frankenstein and the Agents of Shade always reminded me of the Creature Commandos. And uh, I would have it would have been cool to see Frankenstein and the Creature and the uh, Agents of Shade as a DC mo movie. But uh, the Creature Commandos here, I Think this is inspired i i love it i'm looking forward to it i really have no expectations it's it's the dc animated universe james gunn spoke of the else world so a lot of the other movies that are coming down the plate like the flashpoint universe is going to be we know that with the flashpoint universe or or the, the next the flash movie coming out is going to end with introducing us to this new universe the uh, where we're going to get the else worlds and this new dc universe where these movies are going to be coming forward that's going to be followed by blue beetle and there, there's going to be followed we, we're, we are going to be getting the aquaman the lost uh the lost city where that whatever the hell it was but everything's going to fit because the movies that are sort of the remnants of the snyderverse or some quasi hybrid whatever you want to call it, they're off in the Elseworlds. And Elseworlds, it's so good that he's using the phrase Elseworlds because James Gunn is a DC guy. He understands the language and he doesn't insult the movie going audience and he doesn't insult the person listening to him when he speaks. Elseworlds is exactly what it sounds like. It's a world, it's elsewhere, it's Elseworlds. Instead of saying multiverse, the multiverse is a phrase that's used to death. It's so great that we're using the phrase Elseworlds because Elseworlds was originated by the DC Universe. The multiverse itself was originated by the with DC Comics. And so was Elseworlds. So good that we have Elseworlds in the movie slate. And Creature Commandos as part of the animated universe, fantastic. James Gunn also mentioned that, uh, you know, the voices used here is that if they, if these, if the people for these animated, uh, for the, for the animated members of Creatures Commando, the, the, he's going to try to uh, have some synchronicity between that. If you're going to be doing the voice of a character, you're also going to be playing that character in live action. I don't think he said anything about live action Creature Commandos, but wow, wouldn't it be cool if he did? In any event, Waller. Uh, we're going to be getting a Waller series. This is cool. I like this. And this is actually consistent because uh, apparently we, we got, look, I was as shocked as, uh, as anybody that Peacemaker was a great series. I hated Peacemaker. When The Suicide Squad came out, that movie, The Suicide Squad, which I loved, 
James Gunn, I thought, did an, a fantastic job of that. Didn't resonate well at the box office, but boy, oh boy, isn't it odd that something like that didn't, the, the Suicide Squad didn't do well at the box office, but lo and behold, a character that everybody hated in the Suicide Squad, or I, I well, I'm biased. I should watch what I say. Some people may have liked Peacemaker in the movie, The Suicide Squad. I hated him. Because he 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 killed a he killed a character that I liked in that movie, which quite frankly annoyed me. But wow, he won me over. The, the, the HBO series Peach, Peacemaker is fantastic. I love it. Now Waller's coming back, Amanda Waller, and apparently she's going to have her own live action HBO HBO Max show, and she's going to be uh, it's going to be she's going to be teaming up with Team Peacemaker. They're going to have some kind of shenanigans and adventure. Anyways, I, I I'm looking forward to it. Next one is. Uh, Superman Legacy. Now, James Gunn indicated that he's going to be, uh, he's writing this himself, and I think he's going to be directing it. Well, maybe not. I'm, I'm not really sure, but he's he's spearheading this himself, and so he's got a lot of ideas. He did say when he was showing the pictures, he he, uh, he showed the picture of All-Star Superman, and he, he spoke of Superman's compassion, and so one uh, one gets the sense that he's drawing from Grant Morrison's All-Star Superman for inspiration for his version of Superman. And you really get a, a sense that maybe his Superman is going to be a little bit more kind, maybe maybe uh, bringing a lot of compassion and, and, and kindness to the role of superhero. And that's going to be juxtaposed against the authority, which is also coming, which is a hard-ass superhero team, which I'll talk about. And also Superman can be juxtaposed against Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, which we'll also get to and talk about, where Supergirl is, frankly, a little bit more of a tainted and jaded character, uh, for but who ends up just as hopeful and as compassionate as Superman, but frankly, she deserves it more because she's got more to overcome. Because let's face it, I'm gonna one thing about Superman here is that the guy is so boring. And how do you make a how do you make an enjoyable Superman comic? Because let me tell you something. I'm guilty of one thing, and I know lots of people are. As a comic collector, I always want Superman to be more exciting, and I'm always bitching and whining and complaining that I want Superman. You know, he's got to be. You know, Superman wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do that because he's too kind. He's too compassionate. But well. Well, what the hell can Superman do then? Well, Superman always does the right thing. Yeah, 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 but it's boring. It's boring. And so I have to admit, how do you make Superman always doing the right thing and have a kick-ass movie? Well, you know what? They pulled it off. When I I remember Superman 1 and Superman 2, Alexander Salkind and uh, 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 Richard Donner, you know, those those classic Christopher Reeve movies, you, you made you believe that a man could fly and he was kind and compassionate and he did the right thing and he kicked ass. So it can be done, we know it, and it can be done even with terrible special effects. So, <laughs> But Man of Steel was a little darker, uh, but I enjoyed that too. But I kind of want a little bit more of it. I, I want... I, I don't mind the kindness and compassion, but I want there to be some drama. And I like a little bit of character flaws in, in my Man of Steel. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. But in Gun, I trust. And, uh, you know, fingers crossed. Now, a series that I think many of us are looking forward to, I know I am, is uh, Lanterns, live action HBO Max show. And this is essentially like a James Gunn compared to, to True Detective. And they're essentially going to be dealing with a mystery, dealing with a... Um, a terrifying mystery that ties into the larger story of the DCU. And this is interesting because they're basically, obviously, they're members of the Green Lantern Corps and they're stationed to Earth and they're essentially trying to solve a mystery. And we know if it's going to be linked to the larger terrifying menace of the DC Universe, what is that menace going to be? Is it going to be Darkseid? Well, Darkseid we already dealt with in the Snyderverse. Uh, uh, what is what's going to be the major threat in the DC universe? Is it going to be, I don't know, is it going to be Lex Luthor? Is it going to be the Legion of Doom? Is it going to be the authority that we're coming up? What's what's going to be the major threat that we're building to? Because James Gunn talked about a, an eight to ten year plan. So what does that eight to ten year plan look like? Well, we're just getting we're just getting a glimpse here. We got ten things we're going to be going through here, and this is number four, Lantern. So it's really curious. What are the hints of that? This new mysterious, terrifying threat that uh, naughty that maybe John Stewart and Hal Jordan might have some difficulties dealing with. I don't know. And I'm already going through my mind, guys. Tell me who you think who, who you think should be cast as John Stewart or Hal Jordan. I mean, ah oh man, it's uh, it's a tough one. Uh, I I, I kind of get a sense that this is a new DC universe. I want the actors to be young and fresh. I don't want actors from the Marvel universe. 
I know that when we when we get talking about uh, when we get talking about Booster Gold, I don't want Chris Pratt to play Booster Gold. He's a good actor and everything, but I want new actors. I want new across the board. Uh, unless you're talking about villains or something like that. I want new actors for the heroes across the board and young and just tie everything together. Even if it's a little wonky, I don't care. I'm used to wonkiness in the DC comics, but just have fun, but have the plan, have the plan in place. And it looks like Gunn is working toward that. All right. The authority, man, I, uh, James Gunn is, it looks like James Gunn is, is, is working toward whatever happened to truth, justice in the American way which is uh, Action Comics, which is Action Comics 775. And now, for those of you who don't know, uh, in, uh, in Action Comics seven, issue 775, Superman takes on The Authority. Now, The Authority consists of, uh, well, most famously, Midnighter and Apollo, which are basically, they're like, they're a hardcore, hard-ass uh, well, I guess leaders of the authority. The authority is like, they're like the Justice League, but they kill. And they're not afraid to interfere in world's af affairs, to, ki to kill off, to eliminate bad world leaders, terrorists, dictators. They just kill them. They wipe them off the face of the earth. And they, 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 are, they are hardcore and they're awesome. Uh, to the same extent that I love Superman and the Justice League for not killing and for turning the other cheek, for the, for the opposite reasons, I love the authority for saying, you know what, enough of this crap. We're just going to kill you. And I know you said you're not going to do it again, but we're going to kill you anyway, just to be safe. And also, so we can turn to the rest of the world and say, behave. And if the rest of the world asks the authority, well, how should we behave? The authority's answer is usually, well... You figure that out for yourself. If you misbehave, then you'll know because we'll show up. And that's the authority. That's why the authority is awesome. And it looks like we might be building toward a Superman versus the authority, which uh, James Gunn hinted at. And that in Action Comics 775, Superman takes on the authority and does so in an amazing way because he does so in a way that shows that you don't have to kill. You don't have to kill uh, because it was really a battle. It wasn't just a, a battle between Superman and uh, and and Midnighter and Apollo and and uh, the Engineer and Hawk uh, Jack Hawksmore. It wasn't just that. It was and the Doctor. It was it was a battle between two different philosophies. The the battle between do you use lethal force to take out your enemy or can you actually how far can you how far can compassion go this compassion and kindness that james gunn's superman legacy is going to be about how far can that really get you when you're battling some truly truly reprehensible uh and evil forces in the world and we know what the authorities answer is they wipe them off the face of the earth superman has a different answer and so those two different philosophies coming head to head i think promises to be a hell of a good time now, Paradise Lost, this is the one where, this is probably the one that I have the most trepidation about. I, I mean, this doesn't, this is going to be a live action, another HBO Max show. And it's going to be, he mentioned, he said, he mentioned, James Gunn mentioned Game of Thrones taking place on the warring tribes of the Amazons before the time of Wonder Woman and probably leading up to the death or the appearance or the death, the birth of Wonder Woman. And it's called Paradise Lost. My only concern about this, I, I, I'm looking forward to this. I, I personally wish that he would, if they, they get some inspiration from Wonder Woman Historia, Kelly Sue DeConnick's just amazing three issues there, and incorporate some of the gods of, of Zeus and Hera. And I think that would be really cool. However, as, as awesome as I think that would be, my concern would be that I think of Why the Last Man, the comic book Why the Last Man, when it was adopted for TV. It was adopted for TV utilizing present-day world politics and, and the, the feminism in world politics and, and the trans issue and, and all these other political issues and the, the complexities of, of, of just feminism and politics and in the midst of our particular culturally divisive world and politically divided world, I think it's a hotbed of, um, I think they're treading on very potentially, uh, dare I say, dangerous grounds. And look, I'm all for it. 
if they if they can somehow manage to just give us some kick-ass action uh, with intrigue and espionage and politics, as opposed to maybe delving too much into the um, some topics that seem to be divisive in these particular times we live in, uh, all the power to them. I think this is their most difficult project out of all of them. This is the one that if they can pull off Paradise Lost, I think the other ones will come off easy because I, I find this one to be the most difficult for me to really get a handle on conceptually. Um, I Because even even with Wonder Woman Historia, which I really loved, I loved Kelly, Kelly Sudeconic's work on that with fantastic art by uh, 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 Gene Ha and uh, Nicola Scott and... Uh, Phil Jimenez, uh, it's a great work, but to the extent that some people didn't enjoy it, they didn't enjoy it because of the what they perceived as politics and everything else, and and that's that's fine. Everyone has their own opinion. I'm just saying that you want them, you want you want these movies to appeal to a wide audience, as wide an audience as possible. And I wonder if Paradise Lost is going to be able to do that. Now, it's not a movie; it's a live action. It's a live action HBO Max show. So maybe maybe as uh, hey. Who knows? Make me a believer there, James Gunn. In Gunn, I trust. So let's go. All right. So the next one here, Brave and the Bold. Now, interesting. it's interesting that uh, Matt Reeves is the Batman. His sequel, Bat Matt Reeves is going to be able to make his Batman sequel, and that's going to be an Elseworlds tale, an Elseworlds movie, a movie that takes place in another multiverse, in another universe. Meanwhile, there's going to be a brand new Batman in the mainstream DC movie-verse, and it's going to be called Brave and the Bold, or at least that's the working title now, a theatrical film. And it will have Batman with uh, his son. Robin will be Damian Wayne. James Gunn uh, stated very clearly that Damian Wayne is his favorite Robin. And he, he, he got to love Damian Wayne from Grant Morrison. Personally, I thank Grant Morrison for bringing Damian Wayne, giving us Damian Wayne. But I thank even more so uh, Patrick Gleason and uh, Peter Tomasi. Because they made me love Damian Wayne. Uh, I, you know, Grant Morrison, I credit with giving us Damian Wayne, but I thank Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason for making me love the character. And some concerns here is that, you know, Damian is, is a young assassin. Uh, he, and, uh, uh, his mother is Talia Al Gaul. And she, for the first 10 years of Damian Wayne's life, he's trained to be an assassin. And then he ends up, uh, Tally ends up giving to his father, Batman. And uh, in the comic books, it's very well written. And it's written in such a way that young Damian's is extremely, he's extremely narcissistic and overconfident. And he wants to impress his father, Batman. And he's convinced he's going to be Batman one day. And his narcissism actually comes across as very entertaining. But I think the challenge for making a movie Brave and the Bold is two, is twofold. Number one, you're dealing with a 10-year-old assassin. Now, how is that going to go over with parents taking their kid to watch a Batman and Robin movie? A, a young a young 10-year-old or 12, 14, however old they're going to make Damien, who kills? That uh, might be kind of iffy. But also, if if you get the wrong actor for the role... Pulling off narcissism and, and cockiness can be very problematic. If if you if you don't pull it off, you'll only have the audience hate you, and you'll they'll find you annoying. You gotta you gotta find that right balance. So it's the the character of Damian Wayne has to be very carefully chosen. In fact, I would argue even more so than Batman. I can think of a a slew of of actors who, quite frankly, no name actors could 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 be Batman. To be quite blunt about it. Damien as an act, uh, the actor they choose for Damien is going to be the one that's going to make or break this movie, in my opinion. All right, so Booster Gold. Full disclosure, Booster Gold rocks. How's it going? <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, everyone's a fan of Booster Gold, right? Everyone's a fan of Booster Gold, because why not? Because Booster Gold rules. Booster Ga Gold is the greatest character who ever lived he's the greatest superhero who ever lived and he comes from the future he comes from the future and he comes back to present day to make money and he's selfish and he comes back to present day travels in the past so he can make money being a superhero with all the advanced future tech that he has and he's uh well he's <laughs> he's a guy that always screws up but on the plus side he's friends with uh blue beetle but will blue beetle be on the show 
I don't know. But um, I can tell you this. I... <laughs> I'll get the booster off my face there. But I I've never been a big fan of Booster Gold. And I but I understand that a lot of people are. I know that. Every people have been crying for a Booster Gold movie. DC fans want a Booster Gold movie for the longest time. And I have to admit the concept it, it's it's got a lot of it, it's got a lot of great potential. I mean, a guy from the... F Imagine a character, Booster Gold, coming from the 25th century, traveling back in time to the age of heroes, the 21st century, with the goal of being a superhero himself he, because he knows kind of what happens a little bit and he wants to manipulate things to get famous and he's kind of a dick and he has imposter syndrome and that's what James Gunn said. And that's kind of what, that's kind of what he is. And... Uh, He's got imposter syndrome and he's kind of a jerk, uh, but yet there's something about him you can't help but like, and that's Booster Gold. And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, <laughs> what uh, what uh, James Gunn can do with this. All right, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Now, this is the one where uh, I personally, I think this is the, out of all these on the list, this is the one that I'm most looking forward to. And I think this is the most inspired choice. This is also admittedly amongst my comic collecting friends, we, uh, many, they're, they're, we're about 50-50, about half of us uh, really love this series, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, written by Tom King, and the other half don't like it. I love it. Now, the reason why, I want to say why this, in my view, this is the right source material to go, to go by. It's because, number one, it's fantastically written. And I, I know I, I just finished saying people will disagree with me on that demonstrably it's demonstrably you're just demonstrably it's you're wrong if that's that is badly written it's brilliantly written it's brilliantly written and james gunn agrees with me so he's got good taste <laughs> and it's not the fact that it's brilliantly written it's what, what's going to make or break supergirl woman woman of tomorrow is how the script is like tom king is currently writing the script for the movie and after all, he should be because he wrote the comic, so why not give him an opportunity to do the screenplay for the movie? Well, I know that Tom King recently stated in an interview that this is his fifth attempt at a Hollywood script. And he's had four previous attempts that were un unsuccessful where they, they weren't used. And so it all comes down to that. But the, the good news here is that there's checks and balances here. James Gunn has made it very clear that he wants good writing and he wants he's focusing on good writers. He wants the best writers. He feels that the writers have gotten short thrift in Hollywood over the last 10, 15 years, and he wants to change that. So he wants the best ones. And so he's going to Tom King. And the safeguard for those who are not fans of Tom King's comic book writing, and I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of everything Tom King has written. I don't like his Batman run. Nobody likes his Heroes in Crisis. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, pretty much everything else he's written, I've either liked or I've I've either really liked or I've really loved. It's on that spectrum. And, you know, I'm if if King pulls in a bad script and doesn't adapt Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow well, James Gunn will simply have somebody else adapt uh, adapt it. It's that simple. The script is fantastic. It is, it is uh, inspired. It was, uh, you know, it's interesting. Tom King stated that when he originally conceived of this story, he actually had Lobo and Supergirl teaming up, and Lobo was sort of like the uh, Rooster Coburn uh, character, because this is a sort of a riff on True Grit a bit, uh, because it, it deals with sort of getting, it deals with the concept, with the themes of revenge, redemption, and, uh, well, good versus evil, and just plain galactic, uh, galactic battles and, and fun. This comic is, um, those people who don't read it and haven't read it, and claim they have will tell you that it's dark and gloomy and depressing. No, it's not. <laughs> it's it's not just dark, gloomy, and depressing. It's a, it's it's action packed. It's visceral. It it makes you think. It's emo. It it, it can get emotional. Uh, issue six of this eight issue series deals with Supergirl's origin. It makes it clear why Supergirl is not like the kind and compassionate and the perfect Superman. She is kind and she is compassionate. But where she is jaded, and I, I use the word jaded as James Gunn uses it, where she's jaded is that when Krypton exploded, Argo City exploded in one piece. Her father's, uh, her father, who was Jor-El's brother, her, her uncle is 
Jor-El. Her cousin is Superman, as everyone knows. Argo City's intact. They, her father helped create a protective dome around Argo City. And then eventually, radiation, uh, the, the Argo City, the ground be started to turn into kryptonite. Radiation poisoning slowly killed everyone around her. So she not only saw Krypton die, then she saw all her friends and family in Argo City die a slow and painful death. The shielding gave away, and she was literally not only the, the sole survivor of... Uh, was Argo City the sole survivor, of, the sole city survivor of Krypton? But then when it died, Kara was the sole survivor of Argo City. And so she experienced that, uh, actually, what ended up being three traumas before she even gets to Earth. And this story is really about her on her 21st birthday. She's on another planet. And the, the first issue is her starts off with her literally in kind of like a saloon or a, a bar on an alien planet. And she's just getting drunk. She's on a planet with a red sun so that she can get drunk on her 21st birthday, which makes complete sense. There's guys out there saying this, Soup Carl would never do that. Nonsense. What 21 year old doesn't want to get drunk on their birthday? But so many people, uh, I, I'll tell you this, diehard comic book fans who don't like this series uh, are too much into the weeds. You, you gotta step back. The average movie going in an audience will completely resonate with this and relate to this because everything about this story makes sense. Because I personally, what I don't want, and what I don't want, I don't want a blonde bimbo jumping out of a blue rocket ship like in her first appearance, which I own by the way, and where she says, oh, hi Cal, why are you so old? You know, I mean, who cares? I mean, I love it, I, I got it. I mean, I go, it's a beautiful comic, you know, it's in storage, it's fantastic, I love it. but. I don't want that to be the movie. Why? Because I want a more mature movie. I want a more mature movie that feels good, that feels that 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 feels like it's mature, that feels like it has something to say. And I think that the demographic, I think I, I think teenage girls will love this uh, take because they'll be t it's it is a more mature take. She's going to be battling a galactic terrorist because in this story it's a uh, Supergirl actually becomes the mentor to a young girl by the name of Ruthie who wants to avenge the death of her father who's killed by this terrorist named Krem, Krem of Yellow Hills. And Krem becomes a galactic terrorist and, and they follow him around the, the from planet to planet and they encounter all kinds of reprehensible things but also some many beautiful things. They, they encounter both good and evil. They encounter both love and compassion. They they encounter the extremes of of the of war and peace they they encounter all of that and racism and bigotry and all in eight issues it is absolutely fantastic my only concern about this is i'm not sure how you can possibly put these eight issues into a a 2 hour movie uh even a 3 or 4 hour movie i don't think you could do it so it's the create it's the decisions that they make in terms of what what part of this amazing eight issue comic book, what part, of, what parts do you cut out? Because one thing that they're going to keep for sure is her origin. And that alone is going to blow people away. If it's handled, if it had, if the movie has one tenth of the emotional, uh, of, of the emotional intensity of, of, of issue six of this series alone. Wow. Wow. It'll be great. But how, to what extent are they going to incorporate Creme of Yellow Hills, the terrorist? Uh, I suspect they're going to probably truncate it and have him maybe be responsible for maybe the destruction of Argo City and uh, leading to a big battle. And then it, it will end with her being, maybe end with her being on Earth. And maybe they will have her pop out of a blue ship and fly out in a classic pose and, <laughs> and Superman will be there. Who knows? But uh, that'll be cool. I don't, you know, that that's nothing I'd like more than my uh, first appearance as Supergirl to shoot up in price again. That would be awesome. But uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this. And um, this will be, this is by far the most inspired choice out of everything here, with the possible exception of the authority. And I can't, I can't wait. In fact, when Superman battles the authority, if he does end up battling the authority, having Supergirl on his side will be pretty cool because Supergirl... She, she's no pushover, uh, not this version of her. So this is going to, I'm looking forward to this. All right, finally, the last one we have is Swamp Thing. You know what? I've never really been a huge fan of Swamp Thing, but you know, every time I say that, uh, I watch the, uh, I, was it the next, was it on Netflix? What the hell was it? Netflix or Amazon, whatever it was. I watched the first season and 
damn if I didn't really enjoy it. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Ram V, the writer of comic book Ram V. I read his Swamp Thing. His, it, it was uh, originally, I think, an eight issue. Then it became a 10 issue. Then it became a 16 issue run for DC. Thank you, Ram V. You made me appreciate Swamp Thing. I was never into Swamp Thing. Alan Moore never made me appreciate Swamp Thing. I actually stopped collecting, if you can believe this, back in the day. Back in, uh, well, this would have been 1982, 81. I stopped collecting Swamp Thing at issue 19 or 20. And then on issue 21 is when Alan Moore started his classic super run. <laughs> so I never got into Swamp Thing. So I missed all that. And I really only got into Swamp Thing. I got into a little bit with Scott Snyder and the New 52 with, with the green and the red and what have you. And that was kind of cool. But it was Ram V that uh, really sort of made me kind of a more of a Swamp Thing fan. So I'm really curious to see what's going to happen here and what they do with it. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, those are the 10 things that, uh, those are my comments on the, on the 10 bits for the <laughs> DC guys <laughs> for all of this guys. Tell me what you think of, uh, of, of all these things. I, I imagine that, uh, uh, I don't imagine all of you agree with uh, my opinion on all of this stuff, especially Supergirl. I've got, uh, I've got more than a few, uh, comic book uh, friends who think I'm insane for liking uh, Tom King's uh, Supergirl, Woman of Tro Tomorrow. But hey, you know, to each their own. And uh, yeah, in any event, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, until next time, Comic Boom out.